I uh, am grateful for the friendship and the leadership of Dr. Eddie Gray, <coughs> the, the wonderful president of this great institution. Grateful to see Dr. Jim Logan and uh, thank you, Dr. Nathaniel Pierce, for your hospitality uh, during my time here. I am uh, <coughs> humbled by the invitation because I can think of any number of people <coughs> among you that I'd prefer to be listening to right now. Uh, but I thank you for the invitation and the opportunity. From the Gospel according to John, the 12th chapter, beginning with the 20th verse. John chapter 12, beginning with verse 20. I'm going to read it from the Good News translation. It offers us these, <coughs> these words. Some Greeks were among those who had gone to Jerusalem to worship during the festival. They went to Philip. He was from Bethsaida in Galilee and said, Sir, we want to see Jesus. <clears throat> Philip went and told Andrew, and the two of them went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to receive great glory. I am telling you the truth. A grain of wheat remains no more than a single grain, unless it is dropped into the ground and dies. If it does die, then it produces many grains. Those who love their own life will lose it. Those who hate their own life in this world will keep it for life eternal. Whoever wants to serve me must follow me, so that my servant will be with me where I am. And my Father will honor anyone who serves me. Yeah. Sir, we want to see Jesus. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Pray with me for a few minutes on the thought, seeing and believing. All right. <clears throat> Let us pray. Consecrate me now to thy service, Lord, by the power of grace divine. Let my soul look up with a steadfast hope. Let my will be lost in thine. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. 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 Perhaps some of you in here today have been like my family this past three or four weeks stricken with whatever germ or flu bug has been going around. For my part, I, I've been fairly smug, well maybe not smug, but certainly grateful that as others in the community came down with this thing, I had been spared. When it first entered my house with my daughter Bethany, I teased a little bit that I'd had my flu shot. <laughs> so I told her, I wouldn't be participating in all the drama. <laughs> then it hit. One family member after another. Body aches, soreness, headaches, nasal congestion, chest congestion, that awful cough and the inability to sleep because of coughing all night long. It was a perfect storm of viral misery. <laughs> when it finally overtook me, I was in full gallop, preaching preparation, preaching on Sunday, preparation for teaching, preaching twice on Sunday, association business, finalizing our association's final, our spring teaching institute, traveling to the deathbed of a dear friend in Richmond one week and traveling to his funeral the next week. Eventually, it became very difficult to conceal the hacking, painful cough. Mm -hmm. So I reached out for help. Mm -hmm. 
thankfully, one of Charlotte Christian College's students, Reverend Marco McNeil, who's my assistant and a new member of our church, a retired pastor, Dr. Fred Wilson, jumped in to assist with teaching. And deacons jumped in for direct care for members for whom it would have been dangerous for such a journey pastor to show up. <laughs> to be honest, while I'm much better, as are the rest of the family, the cough still won't completely let us go. As I wrestled through this season of discomfort and illness, it occurred to me that this time of disease has special meaning during this season of Lent. I began to realize that going through something has particular significance and symbolism during this holy time of reflection and consecration. As we, along with Jesus, draw closer to his time of crucial confrontation with the forces of evil and darkness, suffering through something provides powerful focus and a reminder of all that is at stake. It was prescient and powerful that the suffering of this flu season coincided with the time when we as believers struggled to see with Jesus the meaning of his own trek through tragedy and trouble. One of the reasons so much of Christianity these days is immature and ignored by the world is that we've allowed the forces of capitalism and consumerism to bleach out of Christianity any semblance of suffering. We've allowed a confectionary Christianity to crystallize right in front of our very eyes in spite of the obvious suffering that exists in the world we live in. So our faith appears impractical and disconnected from the day-to-day -day struggles of real people. This is why so many in the culture these days, to many of them, we followers of Jesus look like an uncaring, unrealistic horde of holier-than-thou bigots whose only reason for being is to serve themselves and point fingers of judgment at others. Our neighbors who are different from us, who think differently, act differently, believe differently, find our faith incapable of addressing the deep valleys of trouble where they find themselves. We seem to live, so it seems to them, on high mountains of perfection, immune from their suffering and protected from their problems. Jesus. Lent is a good time to remember that we are not immune. Yes. Mm -hmm. We are not protected from all of the troubles of this life. This flu season and rampage during Lent for me was a wake-up call, ultimately drawing me back in line with the finite realities of human existence, we all suffer. Yes. We all have limits. Yes, to be human is to have limits. Yes. This, it seems clear, is the reason Jesus never answers the inquiry of some Greeks who approach Philip during the Passover celebration and declare, Sir, we want to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew about their inquiry, and then uh, Philip and Andrew went and told Jesus. Jesus, instead of answering their inquiry, immediately launches into this rather strange and cryptic dialogue about this being the time that the Son of Man, verse 23 says, will receive great glory. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Jesus knew that these Greeks had most likely come looking for him for the wrong reason. The discourse here follows right on the heels of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. And right after that, Jesus rides triumphantly into Jerusalem, looking like a Messiah or something. John editorializes that a lot of people followed after Jesus, not because they really understood what he was doing and why he had come, but because everybody loves a good show. Yeah. When he heard of the Greeks' inquiry, Jesus decided that the time had come to separate out the wheat from the weeds, the men and women from the boys and girls, 
thrill seekers from the truth seekers. He declares in so many words that if you want to see me, it's high time you learned a couple of things. Ah, yes. What is it Jesus wants true believers to learn? First of all, he wants us to learn the limitations of limits. Uh -huh. Verse 24, Jesus is in full speed in this discourse with his disciples. He says, I am telling you the truth. A grain of wheat remains no more than a single grain unless it is dropped into the ground and dies. Yes. If it does die, then it produces many grains. Yes. Curling up and dropping out of everything is the first impulse when the flu hits. Mm -hmm. Feeling sorry for yourself and hosting pity parties is a natural inclination, but these words in verse 24 shift the thinking of a thinking person. Mm -hmm. Jesus makes it clear that the flu is just a sign of human limits. <laughs> but all human limits have limitations. Yes, they have limitations because human limits can never be so restricted that they cancel out the Lord's plan to use the limits for a greater good. In career, in academia, in finance, in politics, in every aspect of life that reminds we humans of human limits, it's good to remember that with Jesus, human limits have unnoticed possibilities. Mm -hmm. The flu was a, was a limit for me, but, but it was an opportunity for Reverend McNeil to stand tall and teach. The flu was a limit for me, but it was an opportunity for Dr. Fred Wilson to take his place in his new church family. The limits of our human experience have limitations. Yes, sir. They may be limits for us, but they are launch pads of opportunity for God. Yes. William Still, of Philadelphia, son of an escaped slave, self-educated, helped thousands of runaway slaves get to Canada and be reunited with their families. He worked extensively with a Quaker named Thomas Garrett of Delaware, another unsung hero who was thrown in jail and lost all of his money because of helping slaves to escape. Hardships, surely, but God used the hardships to set the captives free. Yes, the Tuskegee Airmen, young black men who overcame prejudice and bigotry to become a top-notch group of pilots in World War II. It wasn't the battles that made the difference, it was the overcoming that, that was symbolized by these young men's determination. Last week I met a young 11-year-old girl, a child, who saw a need and, and financed, she, she launched an international movement. Her name is Mongai Fankam. She's from Cameroon, and she went to Cameroon and saw hundreds of children going to school carrying their books in bags and in their, in their bare hands. And she wondered why they had to do such a hard thing when education was already hard enough. And so she decided to come back home and found a movement called the No Backpack Day, mm -hmm. where students in this country go to school without backpacks in solidarity with those kids. And she gave away last year 5,000 backpacks full of school supplies, 11 years old. Mm -hmm. This year, she set her goal for 10,000 backpacks. Jesus is teaching his disciples not to fear the apparent limits of human suffering. Mm -hmm. God has placed some limitations on our limits. Mm -hmm. I've come to say to the theologues and to the staff and faculty here at Charlotte Christian College, don't allow the limitations apparent in your life to limit the possibilities of God in your ministry. Yes. Your limitations, your, your limits can never stop you from doing what God wants if you just realize that your limits have limitations. Yes, sir. They can never take us to a place where God can't reach us. They can never obscure our vision enough that God can't teach us. They can never block us in so completely that God can't free us. Yes, sir. They can never immobilize us so much that God can't use us. Yes, they can never define us enough that God's purpose can't claim us. Uh -huh. Human 
limits can never hurt us enough that real love can heal us. Ah. Human limits can never take from us so much that God can't restore us. Yeah. Human limits can never oppress us so much that God can't set us free. Ah. Jesus wants his disciples to understand that the human limits themselves have limitations. And if, like the Greeks, you want to see Jesus, we must understand and learn that truth. Learn the limitations of limits. Mm -hmm. Jesus also wants his disciples to learn the power of priorities. Uh -huh. Verses 25 and 26, Jesus says, Those who love their own life will lose it. Mm -hmm. Those who hate their own life in this world will keep it for life eternal. Mm -hmm. One can never be clear about priorities unless you first understand and embrace your purpose. Why are you here? I don't mean at Charlotte Christian College. I mean, why are you on earth? Yes, sir. What has God placed you on this earth to do? Yes, sir. Once this is discovered, it will be impossible to entertain faith because you will not be able to help but to live as who you are. Yes, sir. Purpose is akin to vision. I always define vision. Vision is all about what one wants to be. Vision is all about a, a definition of vision, a good working definition is vision is a clear picture of God's preferred future, which can be and must be. Mm. So purpose is akin to vision. That, that's the difference between, for example, churches that just stay open and churches that are alive. Yes. A whole lot of churches are open and full of people, but dead as doorknobs. Mm. Why? Because they don't know why they exist. Yes, sir. A whole lot of people are drawing breath, but really they're zombies. That is the walking dead. Why? Because they don't know they exist, why they exist. As a result, their priorities make them what, what could be called the undead. Yes, sir. To be undead, y'all, is to be dead without knowing or behaving as authentically <laughs> dead. In fact, to be de undead is to not be authentically anything. Mm. In other words, you're too dead to be fully alive and you're moving, so you're not fully dead. This is a state of existential torture. Mm. To know one's purpose, on the other hand, is to operate according to a plan, to have a clear understanding, not only of who you are, but also to know why you are. Yes, this is the challenge of Jesus to we who would try, like these Greeks, to see him. Verse 25 declares that every believer must know why you were born. Verse 26 says when you know why you were born, you won't have any problem figuring out what you must do. Yes, sir. Those who love their own life, 25 says, will lose it. Those who hate their own life in this world will keep it for life eternal. Jesus expresses in, in hyperbolic or exaggerated terms, he expresses it by saying, in order to keep your life, that is forever, you've got to hate your life. He says this because the grain of wheat he just described in verse 25 is peculiar. He says in so many words, you've got to put the life you have in perspective, in theological perspective. You've got to understand that what's most important in life is not you just hanging around, but yes. what's most important in life is conforming your life to the purpose for which God planted you. Yes, you've got to do this. He says, he says this because the grain of wheat he talks about here in verse 25 as being dropped in the ground thrives only because it knows it acts according to its divinely appointed purpose. Yes. The grain, in other words, was created to die. Yes, sir. God designed it so that when it encounters the situation that would spell the end for most other created things, that is, if somebody throws some dirt on top of us, we'll act like we belong under the dirt. If they put enough dirt on us, you will stay under the dirt. Here he says, no, the, the, the seed was designed uh, to do what most other creatures can't do. It adapts under this condition because of its design. And it goes through a remarkable transformation under the ground. While under the ground, a spark of Genesis energy bursts open in the outer shell to reveal something that's been inside all the time. A brand new creation. When it bursts out, it's uniquely adapted to come up out of the ground. In fact, Jesus is suggesting here it was never designed to stay in the ground. It now uses the dirt that was thrown on 
top of it as the delivery system of nutrients and power. And the rain that would normally drown it now combines with the nutrients in a process called imbibation. Enzymes hydrate the new plant and the water enlarges the cells inside the seed and the new plant. And by this time you no longer are a seed, but now you have begun to grow up into your intended purpose. To become something God grows. In other words, the growth could never happen unless the seed in its current form first dies. This is the message of Jesus. He's come to die. He's come to die. And those who want to follow him have got to follow him to that place of death. This is the moment. This is the time when we must consider that our purpose is not just to take up space and draw breath, just to be breath and riches or breath and dresses. We, we must do what Jesus has said we were designed to do. Dietrich Bonhoeffer says God calls us, he bids us to come, to come and die. Dying is not the end of our story. Jesus didn't even respond to the fellows who wanted to see him because he understood that the purpose for which he was here was much bigger than some some seekers are trying to see him. No, if you want to see him, he says, you've got to understand your, you've got to understand your priorities and put your life in its proper perspective. You've got to have your priorities in order. You've got to, he says, everybody who wants to follow me has got to follow me there to the place where I'm dying because I'm not about to be murdered. That ain't why I came. He says, nobody takes my life. I lay it down. And when I get ready, when God raises me up, I'll take my life back up again. This is something the thrill seekers will never understand. But if you understand, if you learn your priorities, why you exist in the first place, follow Jesus into the ground and learn how to die. Verse 26b makes it clear that God will honor you. It now, it now foretastes the glory divine. He says, my father will honor everyone. I know I'm making a lot of noise. Y'all have to excuse me. I'm Baptist. My father will honor everybody who follows me. In other words, you follow me to the place of death, and just like I won't stay dead, one day you'll get up too. If you follow me to the place of death, one day your limits will have limitations. You'll understand that greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. That this God we serve has not called you to be the tail. He's called you to be the head. That's this God we serve has not called you to be a statistic, has not called you to lay under the dirt that life throws on you. No, when the dirt comes, just launch into your purpose. Let God germinate you and then understand, learn your priorities and know that even if they slay me, it's all right. Somebody said in the old book, if I perish, let me perish. I'm going on to do what God called me to do. The fact of the matter is, once you learn your priorities, Resurrection is in your future. Resurrection is your destiny. Eternal life, in, in fact, not everlasting life, eternal life. In John 17, 3, Jesus said, this is life eternal. That is to know you and to know Christ whom you sent. Eternal life in relationship with God, that's your destiny. That's your future. Oh, yes, there will be some risings and fallings. There will be some recalcitrant, godless, entrenched might. There will be some folk dead, plucked up from the root standing in the way of your ministry. There will be some folk who say you can't do it because you're too young or you don't have enough education or because you're a woman. There will be some people who will stop the floodgates of giving, trying to stop God's work in your life. But Jesus says, when you follow me, death can't be your destiny. Uh, Y'all don't believe me. I, I think I saw him die that day on Calvary. Can I go back old school back to Pierce and just tell my story that is on one Friday they killed him. Yes. Vultures circling overhead, uh, looking through their path in the monotonous air, and he died until death died. He <laughs> went down into the grave and preached a revival meeting in hell. And he, got, he preached until Abraham got off the mourner's bench. He preached until Isaiah got saved and understood the eternal significance of his word. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles run and not get weary, walk and not faint. And early Sunday morning, he kicked the back out of the tomb and declared, all power is in my hand. 
hands. And I want you to know today, greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. And just like Jesus got up, his message is those who follow me. Yes, sir. Yes, will sir. go where I am. Yes, sir. And where is he? He's not in the grave. No. He's not in the ground. No, sir. You will follow him. Yes, sir. To death. Yes. And to life. Yes, sir. Evermore. Amen. May God bless you. Amen. May heaven smile upon you. And may you understand and learn who you are in Christ more than all you learn in books. Yes, sir. God bless you. Amen.